uh, again, my name is Molly Day with NSBA, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today on our webinar. Um, I'm really happy to have the expert we have with us today. Uh, Lisa Poino is with uh, Walters Kluwer. They're one of our partners here at NSBA, um, and they offer some really fantastic uh, business services for small businesses. Uh, we know it can be really confusing out there, and they're, they've got some really outstanding resources um, for you. The specific one we're going to talk about today is the Beneficial Ownership Information Reporting Requirements. This is part of the CTA or Corporate Transparency Act, which hopefully most of you are aware of. Um, and Lisa's going to kind of walk through and, and tell you exactly what you need to know, how to file those, and, and all of that good information. Um, I do want to give a quick update for those of you um, who may not be uh, aware of the, the lawsuit that NSBA filed. So um, about two years ago, NSBA filed suit against Treasury over the Corporate Transparency Act, which is the Beneficial Ownership Information Reporting uh, that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, at the end of September, uh, we, we went to the second round of the court case. The first round, um, the judge uh, cited in favor of NSBA and said that the the uh, CTA is unconstitutional. So what that means is that if you were a member as of March 1st of 2024, you do not have to file these reports for now. Uh, and why why we always are given that kind of caveat for now is that um, at the end of September, we had the second round. Uh, the uh, Department of Justice appealed on behalf of Treasury, and we had arguments and, at the end of September. Uh, we expect to hear from that judge by the end of the year. Now, where it gets a little tricky is that by the end of the year is when you need to file those reports. And so we're in kind of a, a conundrum of what to do. And we are reaching out to FinCEN and, and doing everything we can uh, with that group of folks to, to get some guidance on what members should be doing. Um, but if you were not a member as of uh, March 1st, 2024, you do have to file these reports. And that's why we wanted to have this uh, really important webinar with Lisa, who's gonna kind of, like I said, walk you through all of that. Uh, we are gonna uh, keep everybody's lines muted. Uh, we are only going to be doing questions through the chat. We have quite a few people on the line. We're expecting quite a few more, and we are recording this. So all questions will go through the chat. Feel free to throw those in there anytime. Um, my colleague Ian Elsenbach and I will be working on those and, and getting those questions to Lisa in a timely manner. So uh, without further ado, uh, Lisa Poino, take it over. Thank you so much, Molly. And I'm so thrilled to be here today with the NSBA. If you are coming to this webinar today, uncertain about the new beneficial ownership reporting um, requirement that exists this year. If you are not sure whether you need to file or what's included, I, I really hope my goal for you today is to leave our time together feeling more comfortable, more confident about whether your entity needs to file and by when. So give me just one moment to share my slides and then we can get going. All right, so I'm Lisa Poino. I work at Walters Kluwer and I am an expert on beneficial ownership. Here is what we're going to cover today. I'll briefly talk to you about who we are as a company, and then I'm gonna focus on the Corporate Transparency Act, which is the legislative act that gave rise to this beneficial ownership report. I'm going to tell you who needs to file the report, what's reported, when it's due, when you update it, what are the penalties for non-compliance? And then I'm actually gonna walk you through filling out a beneficial ownership report. And then I'll take your questions. So please feel free to put those in the chat box. So I'll spend less than a minute telling you that I, I come to you from a company that creates compliance solutions for lots of different industries. And given that we focus on compliance solutions, Filing a new beneficial ownership report is a piece of a business's compliance. So we created a platform for you to be able to file your report. So let's dig into the nuts and bolts. Why did Congress pass the Corporate Transparency Act? So a bipartisan Congress passed this act in 2021, and pundits have said that it's the most significant piece of federal legislation affecting small businesses in 100 years, basically since the U.S. securities laws were enacted in the 30s. The law went into effect January 1st, 2024, and represents a major shift in how the federal government views small businesses. 
in order to curtail bad actors from using corporate structures and shell companies to commit illegal acts, money laundering, financing of terrorism and tax fraud, Congress passed the Corporate Transparency Act, otherwise known as the CTA, which requires nearly all small businesses to file details about their beneficial owners, meaning who owns their companies, as well as who controls their companies, to file that with the federal government, specifically with FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network within the Department of the Treasury. So what is the reach of this regulation? FinCEN estimates that this reporting requirement affects 32 million entities this year. So 32 million small businesses, most small businesses, will have to file beneficial ownership reports this year. And if you multiply that by the number of people who own and control those businesses, we're getting to a meaningful percentage of all Americans that are going to be touched by this law. Let's briefly talk about the legal challenges to the CTA. As of today, the CTA is still in full force and effect. And if you are a small business, you are likely going to have to file your report. As the NSBA, as Molly pointed out at the beginning of this, the NSBA was successful in Alabama as to getting members of the NSBA as of March 1st, 2024, exempt from having to report under the CTA. However, similar lawsuits in other jurisdictions have not seen that success. So as of today, Secretary Yellen has stated a few times this year, the deadline stands of January 1st, 2025. So you should be preparing to report unless you qualify for the NSBA's exemption or the other exemptions that I'm going to go through today. So that's a brief look at the law itself. Now let's dig into whether you may need to file a BOI report. Which companies? What are those 32 million companies that have to file a report? And really, the hallmark of what makes an entity considered a reporting company, a reporting company has to file a report, is if your entity needed to file a document, think articles of organization, articles of incorporation with a state secretary of state's office or similar office in order to be created. So also think of it like this. In the U.S., an LLC is not an LLC and cannot transact business as an LLC unless articles of an organization are filed with the state secretary of state and the filing is acknowledged. On the contrary, in some states, sole proprietorships can be created without having to file a document with a secretary of state's office or similar office. Those types of entities would not need to report. Companies created under foreign law, but that took the step to register to do business in the U.S. by filing a document with the secretary of state's office or similar office, they are also reporting companies. And interestingly, because of this is the hallmark of what makes an entity subject to this rule, some trusts will have to report. Many homeowners associations will have to report because these entities file the document in order to be created. So it applies to a wide number of companies. Now there are exemptions. FinCEN released 23 exemptions, and then there is the NSBA specific exemption, which would make it 24. Very few small LLCs and corporations and other entities are going to qualify. Keep in mind, so the underlying goal of the act is to uncover business ownership that is able to be concealed within corporate structures. So entities that are already highly regulated by the government, particularly those that already disclose their beneficial owners, are exempt because much of this information is already turned over to the federal government. Tax-exempt entities, public utilities, insurance companies, many charitable organizations. I will take a moment and pause on the large operating company exemption because 
Some, some of you on the line may have a company that is large enough to qualify, or maybe in a year or a few years time, your company will grow to the point that they are able to take advantage of the exemption. So in order to take advantage of the large operating company exemption, you need to meet all three criteria on the screen. You need to have more than $5 million in gross receipts or sales reported in the prior year on your tax return. You need to have more than 20 full-time employees in the U.S. and an operating presence at a physical office in the U.S. Again, all three are required. If you bring in more than 5 million, but you have fewer than 20 full-time employees in the U.S., you would not qualify under this exemption. Now let's focus on what's in the report, okay? So we talked about kind of the first, the first gate, which is, are you the type of entity that has to file this report? And if yes, can you take advantage of an exemption? Now we get to the point, if you do need to report, if you're likely to need to report, who are your beneficial owners? Who are you going to have to disclose in the report? And it's not only owners. So it is people who own or control at least 25% of the ownership interest in the reporting company. However, it also includes people who exercise substantial control over a reporting company. So that includes people in senior positions, people who have authority over the appointment or removal of any senior officers, people who can make decisions about major expenditures. The definition of substantial control is fairly broad. So all of those individuals would have to be listed as beneficial owners on your entity's report. Now, what needs to be reported about those individuals as well as about your entity? So I'll start with the entity. You would need to disclose, and this is on the form, on FinCEN's form, I believe there's 52 fields. You would need to disclose the entity's full legal name, all trade or DBA names, the street address of your principal place of business, where you were formed, or if you're foreign, where you first registered, and your taxpayer identification number. For all beneficial owners, the law requires you to disclose their full legal name, date of birth, residential street address, yes, not work address, not a PO box, their residential street address, an image, of a qualifying document, and that's an unexpired US passport, driver's license, state ID, as well as the unique number on that document where it was issued when it expires. If you were created this year or later, so if your entity was created after, on or after January 1st, 2024, you have to disclose the same information about your company applicants as is required of your beneficial owners. And I'll spend just a moment on company applicant. That could be a new term. If you re recall back, I talked about what makes an entity subject to this rule. And it's if they needed to file a document in order to form the company applicant is the person or persons who filed that document in order to form. So if your CEO filed the document with the Secretary of State's office to create your entity this year, that CEO would be a company applicant. If she directed a paralegal or an attorney to make that filing, that other individual, the attorney or the paralegal would be considered the company applicant. You can only list up to two. And it's again, the person who filed the document to form you, or who directed that filing. And again, it's only for companies created this year or later. Thank goodness, right? If you have an LLC formed in the 70s, you don't have to figure out who filed the document that formed you. So this company applicant piece is only for entities formed this year. Let's talk about due dates. So one of the reasons I'm here with you today is because FinCEN gave entities created before January 1st, 2024. So entities created in 2023 or before, they gave you this year to file. Your initial filing is due January 1st, 2025. If you were created this year, 
FinCEN is giving you 90 calendar days after receiving notice of creation to file your initial report. And starting next year, if you plan on creating entities next year and beyond, add this to your list. You only have 30 calendar days after receiving notice of creation in order to file your initial BOI report. When do you need to update the report? I get this question a lot. Is this like a tax return? Is this an annual report? And it's not. You file your initial report according to the, the guidelines I just shared, the deadlines that I just showed you. And then it is an ongoing obligation. So FinCEN wants the information it has on beneficial owners to be current. So if there are changes to the reporting company information, maybe you change your principal place of business address. Maybe you add a DBA name. Maybe there's a change in beneficial owners. An officer leaves, you hire one. Um, maybe one of your beneficial owners moves to a new residential address. Those are all changes that would trigger the requirement to file a new report within 30 calendar days after the change occurs. So the updating requirement is a significant burden on small businesses, especially considering that you can file for free on FinCEN's website, but it's not saving an electronic copy of your report. So if you fill out your report in those 52 fields this week, and then in February of 2025, one of your beneficial owners moves and you now have 30 days to report that change, you'd actually have to fill out the report all over again. You'd have to refill out the reporting company information, all the beneficial owners, you'd have to file a new and accurate beneficial ownership report. So that um, that is a that is a little bit of the, the sting in the regulation in, in terms of the updating requirement. The penalties, the penalties that are provided for in the act, the civil penalty, um, again, you have until January 1st, 2025 to file, um, $591 per day, the violation continues or the non-compliance continues. And there is a criminal penalty provided for as well, a maximum of $10,000 fines, two years imprisonment or both. FinCEN did proactively state, we're not looking after, to go after small businesses who are acting in good faith. So, um, you know, we, we would expect the criminal penalty to only be meted out against those um, willful violators who are bad actors who were caught trying to hide behind a corporate entity. So how to comply? How do you move forward? How do you make sure that you meet this deadline? What you have to do is you need to file your beneficial ownership report on time and file your updates on time. Now, I had mentioned that FinCEN, you know, this is a federal report that's required to be filed. You can file for free on the FinCEN website. We, as a compliance provider, also provide a place for you to file your beneficial ownership report. Ours comes with a small fee and some of the pieces that we built in, I'll, I'll explain to you, but basically similar to how businesses file their taxes, some do it themselves and they do it for free and others enjoy that more guided experience. It's a step-by-step -step experience for how to fill out the form with definitions, with a live help number you can call and talk to a human about your questions. Um, with ours, your reports are saved. So you're actually, you're getting access to our beneficial ownership dashboard where you'd sign back in, your report would be there. If next, middle of next year, one of your beneficial owners moves, you just find the report you filed, change their address and hit resubmit. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like to fill out a BOI report on our site. And I'm gonna show you all of the, all of the fields you'd need to complete. So it's really not as scary as it sounds. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and show that to you now. All right, so here is our smart form. And Ian is going to put in the chat box a link to this platform. So the NSBA is offering you a discount. If you'd like this more guided experience with the helpline in the bottom right corner, you can see the 888 number. 
Um, this is a place where you can file your BOI report. It maps to the rule. So if the rule requires um, an entry, we ask for it. So full legal name. In our example, Travel to Wisconsin LLC is the name of my entity and it has a DBA name. I disclosed when it was created and where it was created. Now we're gonna report on where it was formed. The rule requires you to disclose if your company is a foreign pooled investment vehicle and then different fields are required to be reported. So the formal shift if you selected that. You will add the taxpayer ID number and then the address. You will choose your address or if you um, are in a new build area, you're gonna wanna type that in manually. So that's the reporting company section. This is the entity information that's required to be disclosed. We confirm it and we are a third of the way through the report. So now we're in the beneficial ownership section. We define these terms for you. So again, we remind you who are beneficial owners, if they exert substantial control over the entity or owner control 25% or more. We also include helpful tips to common questions we get. You know, is there a limit to beneficial owners? No, you have to report all of them. If you're owned by a parent company, a beneficial owner is always a person, never an entity. You need to find the person in the parent company that has substantial control. Company applicant may be a new term as well. So we remind you who that person is, and then we link you to deeper resources if you have more questions, or you can call that 1888 number. So again, helpful links to understand what the form's asking for. So in this example today, my entity Travel to Wisconsin LLC has three beneficial owners. I'm one of them. So I had my information in the, in the um, platform already. So I just checked it over and resaved it. Now I'm gonna manually add the second beneficial owner. Her name is Pam Parsons, and I'm gonna fill out her full legal name, date of birth, home address, so as you can see, this is a decent amount of PII. If I was really the CEO of this organization, I would have had to collect this from Pam and type this in, as well as all the other beneficial owners. The next section asks for the beneficial owner's identifying document. So again, an unexpired U.S. driver's license, passport. If you don't have any of those, a foreign passport is accepted and then information about what's on the ID, as well as an image. So in practice, no one really wants passports and driver's licenses and the sensitive information to be emailed to them and be floating around in their inbox or on their desk. So if you do have more than one beneficial owner in your entity, a value add for you here on this platform is the ability to invite other beneficial owners to fill out their own section. So in the third beneficial owner, I'll show you that, you would select send an invitation. And all you need to know that this is this piece is often used by homeowners associations. If they decide to report all of their board members instead of someone collecting this for eight or nine people, they just collect the email addresses of all their board members and then they email them just like this, a secure link from the platform. And that beneficial owner will come in and fill out their own PII. If they don't want to type in what's on their ID, they can just open up their mobile phone and take a picture of their ID using their camera and we'll extract the information and populate it into the report. Now, if I have multiple entities, and these are my other beneficial owners that are on my other reports, once they're in the system, I can copy and paste them to other reports. Granted, I can't see anyone else's beneficial owners. These are just people who are in the reports that I've already, that I've already filed. So in this example, I'm adding another beneficial owner, Florence. I'm just confirming that her information hasn't changed, and then she's added to the report. You can also easily remove, the, remove a beneficial owner. So you just click the three dot menu and you can remove a person if they're no longer a beneficial owner. The last section of the report is the company applicant. Again, if you were formed this year, you will need to report one or two company applicants. Same information is required as is of beneficial owners. 
individuals can obtain what's called a FinCEN ID. So instead of attaching PII to multiple reports, they can simply have their FinCEN ID input. However, there is a downside. Um, as of now, once you obtain a FinCEN ID, you're under a 30-day obligation to update FinCEN when your PII changes, even after you're no longer a beneficial owner or a company applicant. Now you'll see the full beneficial ownership report. So all three sections, you can print this out, share it with your co-owners. Um, again, it will be saved electronically on our site. And after this, if we confirm it's correct, you'll arrive at the filing screen. You can make a one-time filing, it's $199, but the NSBA is offering 20% off. So you can use their link that Ian put in the chat. Um, if you know you're going to have changes, startups tend to have a lot of changes, changes in ownership, you may want to pay $50 more now, but then you're going to have all of your changes covered. It's actually now until 2026 because we're so close to the end of the year, it would include your changes for, for next year. So once you get to this screen, you'll be, um, you'll be told the, the final cost and you'd enter your credit card just like you would if you were making any other online purchase. And after this, you're gonna arrive at the attestation screen. So again, the rule requires the person submitting to the report to attest that the information is true and accurate. So once you check that box, you are gonna file your report with FinCEN. We are an authorized API participant with FinCEN, and as your report is processing, you're going to be notified when it's been submitted. So you'll arrive back on your homepage, and this is really your home base for staying in compliance with beneficial ownership reporting. You can view all of your entity's reports, and you can view their status as well as see the reports that you're working on. When information changes in the future, you simply go to the report, hit make an update and change that one field versus refiling the entire report from scratch. And again, you have 30 days to fill out that new report once, you're, once your change has been made. So like I mentioned before, you know, beneficial ownership, it can seem daunting, but we've really, we've really tried to simplify it. Now, here is the link in your chat box. So this is the link if you want to file using our platform. It will This link will give you 20% off if you are not sure whether you need to file. Um, we do have a free quiz. Ian will also put this link in the chat box. It, it also is tied to the NSBA's offered 20% off. And this is going to walk you through the regulation question by question. You know, were you formed prior to this year? Do you have more than 20 employees? You know, it'll walk you through. And then at the end, while we can't serve as your lawyer, we can say you are likely to need to file or you are unlikely to need to file. So this quiz has been, has been a really popular resource. So I'd like to take down the presentation now and come on video. I know we have some time and I do see some activity in the chat. So let's see, Molly, what kind of questions you have from the group. Yeah, the first one is um, if the LLC is owned by an irrevocable trust, does it have to file? So it, it depends, right? So you'd have to consider whether it meets that definition of having filed the document in order to form. And if it has... Does it qualify for an exemption? And if it does not, you'd have to identify the person who has substantial control. Um, some of these more complex corporate structures, you may want to engage a lawyer to help you make that first determination of, do I need to file? And then once you've made that determination, you can move on and do the filing yourself um, or you can engage a lawyer or a CPA to do the filing for you. I've heard Prices range from, you know, four hundred and ninety-five for a professional to file it for you up to twelve hundred. Okay. The next question is: uh, if part of the business activity is insurance agency, then is it exempt? So the way that the exemption is written, you'd have to check FinCEN's website to see if partial insurance activity would qualify. You know, I'm not allowed to give legal advice, so it would really depend on 
how that exemption is written, but FinCEN site, I will say they've released over 100 FAQs. So if you go to their site, you'll be able to search it by topic um, and be able to dig in more. They also have a small entity compliance guide that goes deeper into, into the exemptions and definitions. But yeah, I can talk generally about the what the rule says, but I can't um, cross the line and give legal advice. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, do you recommend people get a FinCEN number? It says that it's optional. It is optional, and it you know it is administratively efficient, right? So you'd give all of your PII that you'd put in the report, you'd give it to FinCEN, and FinCEN would spit back um, a twelve-digit number, and you would just attach that to your report. I think that's efficient. The downside, however, is once you have taken the step to get a FinCEN ID, you have to update FinCEN within 30 days of when your PII changes. So if you move and you sold your company, you, you're no longer a beneficial owner, you still are under an obligation to update FinCEN that you moved, that your PII changed. So I hope FinCEN changes the rule in that regard because that part of it seems seems onerous and it seems like something that's going to be easy to forget to do. Lisa, will you tell us again what PII stands for? Sure. It's personally identifiable information. So when you have to report your name, your date of birth, where you live, you know, your home address, your um, the number on your passport, that's all PII information, personally identifiable information. Thank you. We do have a couple questions about, you know, uh, who has control? Is it officers, directors, uh, regardless of ownership percentage? And this is where the law is really tricky from our, our perspective is that it, it's the word substantial control. Uh, is there anything more clarifying there, Lisa, that you can share? Yes, uh, we agree. <laughs> you're, you're in good company. Yes, substantial control. So on FinCEN's website, they do give you several examples. And within our tool as well, we give you some examples. So some of the examples that FinCEN shared is if you have the power to appoint or remove senior officers, they, they said if you carry out the duties that a senior executive would, even without the title, that's substantial control. So if you do the things a CFO would do, even without the title, or that a CEO would do, even without the title, you have substantial control. Thank you. That, that does help clarify a little bit. Um, one, one person asks, if I don't know other BOI addresses, how do I test to their BOI residential addresses? are correct. So th this this gets tricky, right? It's are your beneficial owners giving you the right information? What if they refuse to give you the information period, right? What if you're trying to file your report and they just won't get back to you? They don't want to be bothered by it. Um, FinCEN hasn't given that much clarity on that piece. I know that's that's a tough one. Um, I did read that, you know, the 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 burden is on the reporting company to file. And um, one statement went so far as to say, you may have to consider removing people that are keeping you in a state of non-compliance. Um, and then if you look at the act itself, there is some talk about individuals who willfully fail to comply. There is some liability there. So it is a murky area, um, but nevertheless, FinCEN does want you to file that report. Great. I just uh, popped in the chat, the FinCEN um, website. There's been a couple questions for that. So that is there. It's not specific. I don't think it link, I, there's a link in there to the, re, um, the form, but all the information you might need are in there. Um, just scrolling down real quick. Uh, sorry about that. Um, do you offer multiple company discounts? Yes. Yes. So with the NSBA's discount, um, retail price is 199 for the report. The NSBA offers, um, offers 20% off. And then Molly, the question was if you have more than one entity. So as long as you log in with your same username and password, we recognize you as a past user. So then you're going to get, um, 50%, um, $50 off your other entities that you're that you're applying for. And then the NSBA's 20% will come off of that discount. So yeah, $50 less for every other entity you, you apply for. Great. 
uh, a question kind of in line with that is, is this a one-time cost or do you have to pay every time they make a change each year? Yeah, think of it like your tax returns. So it is you pay per filing that you make. So if you make a filing this month, your initial report, you pay that fee. If in July 2025, you need to file a new report because your information changed, you would pay that fee. Again, with ours, you do have the option to pay $50 more now, and then those changes will be included. If you choose not to do that, the change report um, would be $99 retail. And again, 20% off with the NSBA. Okay. Um, one kind of specific question, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to respond to it, Lisa, but I'll ask anyways. Um, does an insurance agent who has their own company have to file when they represent other insurance providers? Yeah, that would be, you know, it's, I'm not able to say if certain scenarios are able to be um, exempt or not. I know, and I can tell you that there is an insurance company exemption, but whether that scenario would qualify for the exemption, you'd have to actually look at the exemption language itself, or like I said, engage an attorney for that initial question of, does this exemption apply to me or do I need to file? And then you can decide if you want to file the report on your own or not. Okay. There, and I uh, again, it's kind of a specific scenario, but I, I, I think I, I want to ask anyways. Sure. Um, uh, we are owned by Company A, and A is owned by Company B. Is it enough to report the CEO of Company A, or do I need to report someone in Company B? It's not enough to report the CEO of Company A unless that's the only beneficial owner. So. Again, when, when entities are owned by parent companies or owned by other entities, there may not be a person that owns 25% or more. However, FinCEN is looking for the person or people who are exercising substantial control. If it's only that one person, the CEO of company B, I think you said, if, it's, if they're, they're the only person who has substantial control over company A, then that would be acceptable. But the question is, do others qualify as having substantial control over the reporting company? Got it. The, there were a couple questions in here about, um, is the filing free? And I know, Lisa, you mentioned a couple times that you can file uh, directly through FinCEN and there's not a fee there. Um, Walters Kluwer makes it a little bit easier, but there is a fee there. So, and, and but good NSBA discounts too. Um, a question, and and I'll actually feel this one. Lisa asks, um, has Trump or Musk commented on the CTA? I don't know about Musk. Um, Trump was supportive of it before it became law. What back when he was in the uh, in the White House the first time. Um, I don't believe he's commented on it since then. Um, so you know where that might stand with with Trump administration, I, I don't really know. Um, they could certainly try and delay it a little bit or kind of slow roll things. But where it gets really tricky is that uh, the the enactment date was in the law. So Congress is the one who has to change that. Um, and FinCEN doesn't want to push back against Congress, even though Congress is saying, you know, if you need a little extra time, it's probably OK. I mean, everybody's being really wishy-washy about it. But um, but the law is what what the problem is, and those dates were in the law. That's not just something the Treasury is making up. So the administration is somewhat limited unless Congress actually does something about it. Um, next question. Um, what if you close the business prior to the end of 2024? Do you still need to file the BOI by January 1st, 2025? The answer is maybe. So let me explain what the rule says around that. So if your company ceased to exist as a legal entity before this year, before January 1st, 2024, you are not required to file a BOI report. If you existed as a legal entity for any period of time on or after January 1st, 2024, meaning you did not entirely complete the process of formally and irrevocably dissolving before January 1st of this year, you are required to file a report. And FinCEN went so far as to say, even if you were created this year, but you dissolved before your report was due, now think of it in an M&A transaction, sometimes entities are created and dissolved very quickly. Even if you were dissolved before your BOI report was due, as long as you existed for any point this year, you do have to file a BOI report. So there's um, 
another question. Um, before I ask this question, I wanted to ask Ian, if you could pull up the action alert from our website and pop that in the chat, Ian, that would be much appreciated because there's a lot of questions in here about how dumb this law is. And we agree 100%. So uh, we have an action alert. Um, all you have to do is type in your home address. It'll send the alert to your uh, representative and senators. Um, and all, you can go in and edit it a little bit if you want to talk about your business impact. That can always be helpful. Um, but we really encourage you to do that because we agree. It's a pretty dumb law. Congress is the one who needs to do something. We're working every avenue we can with the with the lawsuit, but it, uh, yeah, it's kind of a dumb law. So, there you have it. Um, let me get back to the question. Um, well, if I may, real quick, <clears throat> I'd also like to plug that our uh, NSBA members and leadership council members have been uh, absolutely integral uh, in in our advocacy efforts around uh, a repeal or even just clarity around the Corporate Transparency Act and, and BOI. Um, you know, from from following along uh, Director Gacky's, FinCEN Director Gacky's trail um, in, in going to town halls, to getting in touch with members of Congress directly, to uh, even appearing on uh, radio and television programs. Uh, our, our members have been fantastic. So uh, with that in mind, if you're interested in taking up the mantle in, in a similar capacity, please get in touch with our team and we would love to plug you into some of those efforts. Um, a quick question back to you, Lisa. If you create a FinCEN ID number, can you delete it when you retire? So FinCEN is looking at a way to terminate the FinCEN ID. Currently, there is not a process for that, but they did, you know, they did proactively state they are looking into how you can terminate that, not only when you retire, but, you know, if you sell your interest, if you're no longer a beneficial owner, it certainly would be nice to be able to terminate your FinCEN ID and therefore take you out of that 30-day obligation. Great. Uh, there, There is a question, um, what is the purpose of this new requirement? What is the hoped outcome of all of this? Um, the hoped out the outcome is uh, less money laundering um, and to to catch bad actors. Um, the The reason <laughs> behind all of this, um there were there were rules in place before uh, the CTA was passed. It's um, the consumer due diligence rule, and that's something that banks have to report all of this information. Um, uh, all the information that you guys are going to have to report, Banks had been previously doing it, and they didn't want to do it anymore. And so uh, they worked their their avenues to to get the onus put on small businesses who now have to report it. Um, there was another pretty astute question: was can a lot of this information be found from tax tax documents? Uh, yes, it can. And all Congress would have to do is require that FinCEN and Treasury talk and and communicate that information back and forth. And so, um, yeah, it's a uh, the intent of the law is is noble. Um, obviously, we think money laundering is bad and stopping criminals is a good thing. Um, but, you know, asking criminals to self-report is, again, kind of dumb. So that's where that is. Um, uh, Lana asked the question, how do they verif verify that you're a member of NSBA to be exempt? Again, you had to have been a member of NSBA as of March 1st. Um, staff is in the process of, of putting together letters uh, to send to all of our members as of March 1st. We'll be getting those out by the beginning of December. So keep a lookout for that. Um, and then that's just something that, that you know, we think you should keep handy and have on file. Um, we've reached out or we're in the process of reaching out to FINCEN and asking for some guidance on, you know, what do we tell our members to do? Do they submit this letter to you? Do they just do nothing? Just wait for you to come knocking on their door. So uh, they've been... Um, uh, very lax in getting information out um, to to all small businesses in the country, um, even more so about how NSBA members should should proceed under under this new um, rule. So, um, I'm trying to okay. The another question was how is the appeal going that started September 27th? It's anybody's guess. To be very honest, um, we're hopeful to have a ruling by the end of the year. Um, but when we had our first arguments, we were hopeful to have the rule by the end of the year from that judge, and we didn't get that until March 1st. And so, um, again, the, the lawyers are hopeful that because the law, I mean, you have to have your reports done in January, um, that we'll have a ruling before then, but uh, it's it's really anybody's guess, unfortunately. Um, I, Ian, have you come across any other questions here for Lisa that we want to ask before we close things out? That's... Um... And forgive me, just taking a look 
um, at some of the additional questions regarding NSBA that are, that are coming in here. Um, let's see, just to, to clarify one more time, again, uh, currently only NSBA members on or before March 1st of 2024 are currently exempt. And again, with the caveat that uh, only the entities uh, registered to NSBA are exempt. So if you have uh, you know, multiple entities, it'll only be the, the one with the NSBA membership that is exempt from, uh, from filing in compliance. Um, with that clarification, uh, Molly, I'm not seeing, seeing much else. We'll, we'll Great. give kind of a, a final notice here. Great. Thanks for keeping a look on that, Ian. So we'll, we'll go ahead and close the Q and A. Um, Lisa, I'll turn it back over to you for any any final thoughts or comments. Oh, I just I just wish everyone the best of luck. I know this is a new report. It's a new requirement. The deadline is coming. What do we have? 48 days now. I think FinCEN's last statement was 25.5 million businesses need to file in 49 or 48 days, praying that we don't break the internet. Um, so so best best of luck to you all. Thank you so much, NSBA, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Lisa. We appreciate it. And you know, I there is just another quick quick question about the lawsuit. Um, it, with the appellate court, the what could change there if those judges rule in our favor? Um, that will apply to companies in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida because that's the district that that court is in. It will not apply most likely to um, businesses across the country. We anticipate um, uh, uh, DOJ will appeal if they lose this case or this this layer. Um, so, so that's kind of where it is. It's it's pretty unlikely that this next ruling will uh, completely throw the law out, law out entirely because we do anticipate an appeal from DOJ, and then it would just be those three states. So, um, with that, I, again, Lisa, thank you so much. And it, you, if you guys do have to do these reports. Um, to support companies that support small business. Walters Kluwer is, is that company. Um, they've been really great to NSBA. They're friends of small business. So hopefully you found this information useful. We will be getting out uh, a recording of this and we'll send that to, uh, to everybody in the next day or two. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. So thanks everybody for your time and have a good rest of your afternoon. Bye.